the subject tonight is love. So this is actually a poem by Hafiz. He says, the subject tonight is love and for tomorrow night as well. As a matter of fact, I know of no better topic for us to discuss until we all die. <laughs> so this is our topic for the for these next two sessions at least. So this is actually a video uh, where we see how every each one of us can response. Each one of us, we are all um, we all whether we are a human being or an animal mm. or even a plant. Mm. My mother is a gardener and she says that even plants respond to love. Mm. So if we really go beneath all our differences and go down to the core of who we are, we are entities who um, who want to love and to be loved, mm. right? So it's, it's at the very core of us. And so we, so this is a video of uh, this baby goat, two baby goats and a mother goat. trembling and frightened. Two little six-week-old lambs, sisters, saved from an overcrowded farm where they were being raised for meat. They refused to approach us and wouldn't even drink from their bottles. We were desperately concerned for their health, so we investigated and discovered that their mother was still at the farm just days away from slaughter. We immediately began working to save her life and reunite her with her babies. Thankfully, after much pressure, we won. When the mother arrived at Freedom Farm, she was scared and injured. Her cry was heard by her babies, and the rest you will see for yourself. <coughs> separated again. Several residents came to greet the newly reunited family. It goes on. <laughs> it's uh, such a powerful force. I was watching another documentary um, where um, they, sh they showed how even like little babies, mm. right? They, they did this experiment um, with little babies who don't really, you know, can formulate like what they're feeling. And so what they did was they first had these babies sit in a room with their mother mm. and their mother was constantly like cooing to them and talking to them. And then, and then um, they switched, they, they instructed the mother um, uh, as they were observing that, that now just become still faced, like just don't respond. And so the baby actually um, was a very, very like an infant then realized that the mother is not responding anymore. Mm. So then the baby started to like find ways to get the mother's attention. Mm. And the mother just would not uh, respond. And so finally, um, when uh, the baby was just like started to really, really cry. And then, so then the instruction was given to the mother that now you respond to the baby. Mm. So when the mother then finally responds to the baby, then the baby responds with like so much of anger. anger. <laughs> you know, why did you ignore me? So it's like, it's so deep within us, right? This I deep. think that's what really moves us. That's the the fountainhead of all the emotions that we have is, is this longing to be loved, to be sheltered, and then to love in return. And this is what the, what the bhakti process is, is this uh, eternal love that exists between the soul and, and, and Krishna. Actually, Bhakti Tirth Maharaj would always say that there are only two expressions in the world. Mm. There is a cry for love and there is an expression of love, mm. right? So if you see beneath our fear, beneath our anger beneath whatever emotions we have it is some unmet mm. expectation for love right so anyways just um this is at the very heart of bhakti which bhakti literally means to find that perfect love and i guess 
Another name for bhakti that is given in, in our scriptures is rasa, which means we are all looking for this um, mellow or taste in, in our different um, parts of our life and different existences. And searching for that mellow, instead of searching for that original mellow of love, we try to repose it in, in different ways and in, in trying to find different thing, things in this world. And once we find it, then that doesn't satisfy us. We want, we want to find something else. And this is an example of that, that uh, if you go to New York on the airport, you will see an ad for Costa Rica. And if you go to Costa Rica, then you will see an ad for New York. Can I just add something? And Prabhupada mm. actually calls this Bhoga Tyaga, mm. right? So it's a, it's a fluctuation that we are never satisfied. Bhoga means I try to enjoy something, then I get frustrated and I give it up, which is called Tyaga. And then I go back to it, mm. right? So this back and forth. And the reason for that is because we don't find a resting place in any of the rasas. Mm. Rasa simply means a taste, mm. right? In the simplest sense. So we'll watch this. So this is somebody watching this at the New York airport. <laughs> By the way, we love Costa Rica. We've gone there. No, no, there should be a sound to me. In the jungle, the city jungle, the human works tonight. In the jungle, the concrete jungle, he's becoming so untied. <laughs> <laughs> this as the spiritual world which is calling us that this is the real taste we are looking for and then if you're in costa rica then they show this ad about new york on the, in the airport person in, New York, in Costa Rica wants to experience the nightlife of uh, New, York, New York, right? Times Square. And a person who's in New York working really hard and tired of the concrete jungle wants to get away from it and mm. visit Costa Rica. So Prabhupada actually talks about this principle in this very, very wonderful book text called The Nectar of Devotion. Mm. And so he says that um, that force which drives the philanthropist, the householder and the nationalist is called rasa or a kind of mellow whose taste is very sweet. Bhakti rasa is a mellow different from the ordinary rasa enjoyed by mundane workers. Mundane workers labor very hard day and night in order to relish a certain kind of rasa that is understood as sense gratification. The relish or taste of the mundane rasa does not long endure and therefore mundane workers are always apt to change their position of enjoyment. A businessman is not satisfied by working the whole week, therefore wanting a change for the weekend, he goes to a place where he tries to forget his business activities. Then after the weekend is spent in forgetfulness, he again changes his position and resumes his actual business activities. Material engagement means accepting a particular status for some time and then changing it. This position of changing back and forth is technically known as bhoga tyaga, mm. which means a position of alternating sense enjoyment and renunciation. I think that is the nature of this material world or, or any kind of material enjoyment that um, it, it is bhoga and tyaga. When we are enjoying something, then we should understand that there will come a time very quickly when we don't want to enjoy it or we cannot enjoy it. Mm. So it goes on. Maybe one day we can read this as well. But we just wanted to make this point that uh, this kind of taste, we do. No one can ever deny that there is no taste in this material world. Mm. There is some taste. 
but that taste is uh, the Sanskrit word is chapala, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's constantly flickering, so we are not able to experience this taste that the heart is hankering for. And neither can we hold it, nor can we increase it. And in fact, there is a law of diminishing return, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How many pizza slices can you eat, mm -hmm. or how many? whatever is our favorite activity after a while. Like, Lok like Lokadash always says, like, yeah, I can go to Costa Rica, but can I really stay there? Mm. Sometimes I love New York, but can, how, how long can I really stay there, right? So. So I guess this rasa is, is, is what we're talking about. And um, especially this Bhakti rasa, it has this special quality of warmth mm -hmm. and attraction that actually melts the heart of every single living entity it even melts the heart of krishna so this is a famous story yeah so sometimes you know like we have so many processes right of opening up our heart and one way like the jnana process is like holding the hand the fist really tight and how long can we do that it's not a natural state and that's the reason why you know jnana becomes very dry it's described that jnana is like eating a, a dry cane of like should, mm. like a dry cane of stick it's hard and it's dry mm. but bhakti is like eating a, 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 like a stalk of sugar cane it's filled with so much sweetness like all the path in fact the path of yoga the path of meditation uh, the path of karma all, all these paths are very very difficult very dry uh, krishna very says dry. that later yeah. in the 12th chapter so this is you know this goes to show that like there was once a contest between the wind god and the sun god and they they said okay who's who's stronger and so, you know, they said, all right, there is this man who's walking by, you know, whoever can get this man to take off or shed off his jacket, mm -hmm. you know, that person is going to be, uh, you know, we're going to declare that person to be stronger or superior. So the wind said, oh, that is not difficult at all. I'm just going to really, really blow very hard. And, you know, so he starts to do that. He has a lot of strength. And so he continues to just blow really, really hard. The, the harder he blows, the more the man actually holds on very, very tight to his jacket mm. and, you know, it's feeling cold. And then the sun, he, you know, he just smiles. And so he says, when, when it's in his turn, he simply just shines, mm. right? He simply shines and, and gives out his warmth and his love. And immediately the man feels warm and he takes off his jacket. Mm. So in the same way, we are also carrying these loads and loads and loads of jacket, mm. of yes. layers of clothing on us. And so, you know, we can actually, it's easier for us to, uh, like Brené Brown talks about, you know, the power of being vulnerable, mm, right? Mm. So um, how do we become vulnerable? So bhakti is the process of actually opening up the heart and allowing us to feel comfortable mm. in, and, and, and bask in the, in the warm, you know, uh, rays of the sun. So this is another way bhakti is described that bhakti is gratitude. Uh, the other way, um, it's, it's the gratitude of yoga, yoga of gratitude, actually. So um, let's... Uh, Can yeah, we speak a little? It's actually uh, gratitude in action, right? Mm -hmm. Bhakti is gratitude in action. And it's, and as we'll look, you know, see later that, um, you know, when, um, when we are grateful, then we can be truly happy. Mm -hmm. There are studies over studies over studies. People think that you'll be, one can be, uh, one can be grateful when one is when happy. happy yeah. But it's actually the other way around that one can be, uh, happy when you're grateful, mm. right? So gratitude is actually a practice and bhakti yoga is that practice. Mm. And so we can see how. I believe that grace is a direct response to gratitude. That the more grateful you are, the more grace steps in and shows itself and mirrors the gratitude that you have. So grace in this case, you know, we could understand that as being bhakti, right? So there are, you know, in fact, just today I was looking at these different studies that show that when people live a life of gratitude or even when they maintain a gratitude journal or they take out like two weeks out of their life and just practice gratitude, their happiness quotient just really, really goes up, mm. right? So, um, so plenty of studies on this. So, so, you know, so what, you know, so this devotion, this bhakti, like Prabhupada is describing here, just like we're looking for rasa. So the joy of devotion really means bhakti rasa. So we are, oh, there is a particular taste uh, that is contained uh, within the process of bhakti. 
which is very special and it is uh, it's enduring so it never um in fact it is um anandam buddhivardhana which means that it is continuously increasing and that is the taste that we are actually hankering for so you know let's watch and then we'll maybe and this is a documentary that you guys can watch to the like full documentary it's wonderfully done and maybe we'll do it together one day but if you're welcome to do it on do your you know own what, what Yeah, so we can start. No, no, let the first point system. This is the verse that we did in ninth chapter. She said, "This is the turning point in your life. This is what we're looking for." And indeed, it was. Changes completely. Please. Was incorporating the society. I didn't know what it would mean for the future. different types of yoga bhakti yoga is the yoga of devotion it's not a matter of exercise it's not a matter of concentrating on a god but it's a matter of devotion to the lord shri 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 bhakti comes from the sanskrit root bhaj which means to share and bhakti is all about sharing it really cannot be done alone in a cave in the himalayas bhakti is first and foremost about a relationship and in most bhakti traditions uh, there's a whole variety of different bhakti traditions what's shared by these different traditions is the idea of establishing a personal intimate loving relationship with the divine as a personal god i mean there's something about the way in which krishna is characterized as this god who's first and foremost the god of leela he's the god of play and he's a joyous god Bhakti is rooted in an ancient tradition which is in contemporary times known as Hinduism. At the same time, the principles that are espoused are universal, they're applicable to everyone, they're accessible to everyone. Many traditions, if not all traditions, have this element of devotion. Uh certainly it's obvious in Christianity that there would be a strong sense of loving God, loving neighbor, loving God as God loves us. and i think in certain forms of islam and judaism likewise there would be a sense of devotion and love and even in traditions that are not directly theistic such as certain forms of buddhism there may be a, an attitude of bhakti or devotion toward the buddha or toward one of the saints or something like that actually it's kind of interesting in the pause here there's three just major i just wanted to make this point that um you know what is what has been a, 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 you know um something that has been really um, sacred to me is the fact that the the vedic texts the bhakti texts from the vedas they really describe the the characteristics or sort of the composition of what pure bhakti is mm -hmm. so once one one understands what pure bhakti is then one can actually venture out and one can see these threads in all these different traditions because mm -hmm. each of these traditions carry within them the thread of gyana the thread of bhakti karma. the thread of karma all these threads are are contained in all these traditions so once one understands how to separate the impurities from the the real the real substance then one can start to identify mm. what is a mixture and what is pure mm. and then we have another one for part 2 and mystics in the bhakti yoga traditions point out that of all the practices that one can do of all the various ways and paths and means of connecting with the divine of connecting with krishna in a spirit of love and devotion chanting particularly through kirtan is the most essential and in some ways is the foundation of all the others so kirtan is um a sanskrit word which in its most literal sense means uh, to glorify. This is a glorification that's very much coming from the heart. This is not platitudes or giving someone a lukewarm compliment. This is when you are head over heels in love with someone and you have to shout it from the rooftops and you have to proclaim it and just sing their glories to everyone you meet because it's just it's overflowing from your heart. <laughs> Oh, oh, oh. This 
more, I think. A musician, a professional musician, and I'm fortunate enough to experience uh, the uh, the thrills of being okay. uh, yes. a number. So very beautiful. Um, video, as you can see. One artist in many countries all around the world. So, go ahead. So this is a very interesting story. We'll, we'll read this verse in the Bhagavad Gita, how this is bhakti is something that really attracts Krishna and he becomes uh, bound by the love and devotion uh, of the devotee. So much so that he, he takes the vow that I'll carry what you lack and I'll preserve what you have. And, and to prove this, there is a this wonderful story of this uh, Brahmana who was very poor. Uh, as you can see, uh, they didn't have enough uh, food to eat and this poor Brahmana was just engaged in his devotional service. And uh, after many such days, uh, the wife is complaining and the children, they don't have anything to eat. So the Brahmana becomes very frustrated. And, and one day he's thinking that Krishna, you say in Bhagavad Gita that uh, you carry what we lack and then preserve what we have. So what about me? I mean, I, I don't have en enough food to eat. So when will you take care of me? Also, I think he's thinking that Vahamyaha means that I will personally carry. Mm. So uh, it's like a vehicle, mm. right? So he's thinking that how is it for maybe he will use his agent mm. or maybe he will use his energy to provide. But he personally carrying what you lack, mm. like that felt a little like much to him, mm. like something he couldn't really digest. And so um, he took a pen and he sort of like cut off that portion, right? And I think he changed the word even. Not sure exactly. And he just cut off those, he two, cut lines. Off those two lines. Bahameham. And then he went out. In the meantime, you know, the wife was home and there was nothing to cook. And the, there was somebody who came at the door and they, you know, he was this young boy, very, very beautiful, very tender looking. And he was carrying this heavy, heavy, heavy bag mm. uh, of, of food stuff. And so, uh, and then he said, um, he, you know, he said, yeah, you know, my, my, uh, you know, basically this Brahmana, He's my, he's my guru and he has sent all this food stuff for, for you. And she, she said, I didn't know that my husband had any disciples. He said, yes, yes, he does. And he's very, very strict. Mm. And, uh, and, and, you know, and then, you know, and actually he makes me carry these heavy loads <laughs> and not just that, like when I, you know, sometimes he even beats me up. And then, she, then this boy showed how on his uh, back, there were these three, um, like, um, marks, marks of, like uh, someone had actually Hit, hit him and the wife was very shocked because she thought oh my husband is not like that he's such a gentle brahmana how is this possible so anyway she took um, so then he, she said okay i'm sorry that he treated you like this but please come in and i you know just eat something and she he said no 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 before your husband comes we need to leave mm -hmm. you, know, you just take this food stuff and then we'll leave and so that he you know she takes it and then when the husband comes then the wife is really upset with the husband and she says i always thought of you as a very cultured Brahmana, but you you treated this young boy and you've you know made him carry this heavy load for you. What's wrong with you? And he says, No, I did not. You and know? then the Brahmana asked his wife, but can you describe that boy? And and the, the lady started describing the boy. And at once this Brahmana understood that what had happened. And uh, he regretted and he realized that how Krishna personally came and, and he personally carries what we lack. Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is something that can give us a lot of hope and enthusiasm and bhakti that uh, Krishna is, is personally invested in each, each, each one of his devotees. Because sometimes when we think about bhakti, we think, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm loving, but what about me? Mm. Right? So this, this verse sort, sort of indicates that bhakti is a reciprocal process, mm. that we are loving and, and you know, that, with that whom we are seeking is also seeking us in return, mm. right? And so, you know, in, in that way, um, we, we experience this great And right from the very beginning, it's a two-way process. It's not that we have to move to a certain distance and then Krishna will start loving us back or reciprocating. It's, it's always two-way right from the very beginning. Mm. So these are the six characters, this great book called Nectar of Devotion or Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. It describes Bhakti. Uh, there are six characteristics of Bhakti, uh, which are... Uh, very uh, heartwarming to, to know uh, when we first read it, it really touched, touched our hearts. So it's like described as the seed of bhakti is like a seed. And when the seed fructifies or when the seed starts germinating, then first two leaves come out from that seed. 
So those first two leaves are described as the, the first two characteristics of bhakti. So from the top, uh, there are two characteristics, subhada, which means auspiciousness, and kleshagne, which means relief from miseries. So these are the first two leaves that come out. Auspicious, bhakti is all auspicious because uh, it removes uh, all the unwanted things in our life. It removes all the unwanted habits from our life. It removes unwanted desires from our life. And then we start acting in a way that is most beneficial for ourselves and everybody around us. And it, it brings this auspicious spiritual energy in, in every aspect of our life. That's why it's called Shubhada. Kleshagni, uh, we've talked uh, in great detail about karma, right? So Kleshagni means that as soon as we start the process of bhakti, mm. not that we have become perfected, but even in the beginning stages of bhakti, immediately all the karmic reactions that have been troubling us, the suffering, they all start to get mitigated. So, uh, so there's a klesha or a fire within the heart and that fire starts to get mitigated. So that is Kleshagni. And so those are the first two initial result of starting on the path of bhakti. So it, it may not mean that because we have a body, there will be some amount of suffering in this world. This is how this material world is designed. But Kleshagni literally means that uh, the, the large heap or the large pile of this karmic reaction that was standing in front of us and then that was going to produce so much suffering in, in our life in the future, that starts immediately get uh, burnt away. And, and so our path back to Krishna starts becoming more clear and we can start actually seeing, okay, I can, I can get there. And that is the meaning of Kleshagni. Our separation from Krishna starts getting mitigated. And then the third one is Moksha Laghu Takrita, which means that a person who, has, who finds bhakti to him, even liberation is of not much consequence and mm -hmm. derides liberation. In fact, it is described that the goddess of mukti, liberation, she stands uh, with her hands folded in front of a devotee saying that, how may I serve you? Mm -hmm. But a devotee um, is willing to experience any kind of um, difficulty to actually serve Krishna. And of course, there's another very beautiful story. Maybe it's, you, could, maybe you could share that story mm -hmm. about... Um, about how one time Krishna actually has a headache. Mm. And uh, when Krishna has this headache, um, you know, everybody's trying to find a cure for him. The, the great Ayurveda, you know, the Vedyas come and they just, couldn't, they just can't find a cure. And so finally they ask Krishna, it's like, what can we do? And Krishna says, yes, there is a cure for my headache. And that is that if you can bring for me the dust from the feet of my pure devotee, mm. and if you smear it on my forehead, then my headache can be cured. Mm. And so, you know, it's like, okay, that's a difficult task because who's going to be willing to offer their dust from their feet mm. to be smeared on Krishna's forehead. Mm. So they first go to the queens of Dwaraka who are, you know, the goddesses of fortune. And they say, you know, can you please, you know, give us the dust? And the queens, they refuse. They said, oh my goodness, he's our husband. And, you know, this is actually a great offense, you know, to actually place our, you know, dust uh, our lotus, you know, our foot dust on his on his forehead. So I'm sorry, but we cannot do it. And then Narada, this is Narada's doing this service. And so then he finally, he goes to a Brahmana. Mm. The Brahmana says, no, he's my Lord. I worship him, you know, with so much of reverence. How can I do that? Finally, they go to Vrindavan where the gopis live. And these gopis are, they just love Krishna. They don't care. So as soon as Narada says Krishna has a headache and he needs the foot dust, immediately the gopis enter into the river of Yamuna. And then they come back and then they start, you know, um, jumping on the sands and saying, okay, here, take as much dust as you want mm. and, you know, give it to Krishna. And so then Narada is very surprised and he thinks, you know, what's wrong with you girls? You know, don't you know that this is actually a great offense? And then for this offense, you may even have to you know, enter into the hellish uh, planets. And the gopi's response is that, you know, in order for Krishna to be relieved of his headache, even for a second, if we have to suffer in the hellish planets, for eternity, then that becomes the source of our greatest happiness. Mm. So this is the nature of their love, mm. which is you know, the perfection and they don't care. Mm. Yeah, the, the happiness uh, derived from liberation becomes like, uh, if you compare the water in a cup and the water in the ocean, so the water in a cup is like the happiness derived from liberation and the water in the ocean is, is like the happiness derived from bhakti. Mm. So for uh, devotee, even from the very beginning, one can start experiencing that I don't care about the pleasures of this world and a devotee doesn't care about the pleasures of the heavenly planets or the planet of Brahma or even beyond. All those happiness and pleasure, they are insignificant com in comparison to 
the happiness that comes from bhakti. Mm. And even a beginner, even a beginner devotee can experience that. Mm. The next one is Sudurlava, which Durlava means difficult to achieve. And uh, Sudurlava means very, very difficult to achieve. So this is another characteristic of bhakti that uh, it is difficult to achieve, but um, by the mercy of a devotee, uh, a bhakti can be very easily achieved. So although one cannot acquire bhakti by one's own effort, like jnana and yoga and all those things, one can actually acquire the fruits of those processes by one's own effort. But bhakti, you cannot acquire it with your own effort, just by your own effort. You need uh, the mercy uh, of a devotee through which bhakti comes. And, uh, and therefore, it's also very, very easy to achieve, but at the same time, very difficult to achieve. And then the last two, um, it's a super condensed bliss mm. and that it's the only thing that can attract Krishna. Mm. So Krishna is not attracted by our scholarly erudition, our intelligence, right? Mm. Our uh, beauty, our strength, our wealth, whatever opulences we may have, you know, he's the source of it. Mm. So, he, you know, he's not attracted by any of that. But what does attract him is this is this heart which is filled with gratitude and love, mm. you know, and that, you know, that is the only thing that can actually bind Krishna. Mm. So. And this is what actually attracts Krishna is this unalloyed bhakti. And what is unalloyed bhakti? Uh, this is again described by Rupa Goswami in Bhakti Vesamita Sindhu. He says, Anya bhilashita shunyam jnana karmadi navritam anukullena krishnanu shilanam bhakti ruttama. So anya bhilashita means there is no other desire. Anya bhilashita shunyam. There is no other desire for uh, achieving perfection through any other method or, or there is no other desire in, in one's life other than to please Krishna. And it is completely free from the traces of jnana and karma. Jnana means speculative knowledge or uh, trying to uh, uh, achieve a higher position through our knowledge and, and, and karma is also trying to uh, have a fruity mentality that I want to do this because I want to get something out of it. So even with bhakti, right? In the beginning, our bhakti is not pure mm. and there might be some mixture. So the kind, like we talked about how bhakti can attract Krishna. So mm. the kind of bhakti that can attract Krishna is a quality. Mm. And this is what we were talking about earlier. It's like getting to know what constitutes pure bhakti. Mm. So pure bhakti means no trace of any personal motivation mm. and no trace of any, even any philosophical speculation. But that's not enough. That's sort of like a negative definition. Uh, the positive definition is that it is completely and totally meant for the satisfaction of Krishna. Mm. So it's favorably performed for the satisfaction of Krishna. So when one actually has that mood that I want to love, I want to give, I want to offer myself to Krishna through, you know, through the, and to the devotees, right? There's no difference. That's mm. another subtle point. But anyways, that's actually is what pure bhakti and that is, that has the power to bind Krishna. Mm. Otherwise he's practically impossible. Mm. The yogi is actually right. They spend like their whole life trying to meditate and perform such severe austerities. Mm. And they cannot even get a glimpse of one of the rays that actually emanate from one of the toenails mm. of Krishna's lotus feet, mm. right? So what to speak of binding Krishna? Mm. So this is actually a very elevated platform and it happens by this pure bhakti. So this is another documentary. of mystic yoga who mm -hmm. blew mm -hmm. the seeds of divine love into the hearts of women all over the world. Just give us a minute, we just need to see what the... A little bit of a flaw in the Zoom. Um... Please come back to the camera. No, 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 it's okay. I, 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 can, I can find it, hold on. So, just give this a minute. But I have you, that I'm yours. This is Bhakti. I'm a pilgrim here. I'm 
walking through, walking through this world today or tomorrow, you know, I'll be gone. But but that offering is eternal. So what is it, This is Mayapur. It's a beautiful place. And this is a beautiful thing about bhakti that all the different art forms, singing, dancing, theater, writing, poetry, they all find their highest expression in bhakti. Joyfully performed, right? So, so, so come. And then, if you go to India, you can actually see these village women. Who are sitting there and singing Krishna's names? So just singing Krishna's names, just completely, you know, happy. This is the land of Vrindavan. <laughs> every stone, the name of Krishna and Radha and Sri is written on every wall. <laughs> Yamuna Devi. Four years practicing bhakti yoga every day. Every day I can do express, but there's a certain love that is only for God and can only be truly reciprocated by God. And I've been 44 years practicing bhakti yoga every day. Every day I can say that. And every day it's a richer. I, but there's just, we have so many ups and downs in life. We climb hills and go through valleys and in and out. But I can say that bhakti yoga is a, a shelter and a foundation that allows one to, to take these things with grace. So it's very powerful. It's a nugget of, um, that you think is very small, but it's actually a great, great jewel. And bhakti is service to God, service to man, service to self. It's very powerful. Whenever you catch a drop of it, you're there anyway. It's very relevant to the lives of ordinary people like you and I. She's uh, one of our, um, uh, one mm -hmm. of the devotees that we really look up to. Uh, she was Prabhupada's uh, very, very dear disciple and received a lot of personal uh, association of Prabhupada. And she left her body a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And um, so I especially like this point that she made about how it's also service to the self mm. because we hear that so much right now about how self-love is so important and this is truly one of the best ways we can love ourselves mm. uh, by allowing the self to be reunited mm. with Krishna because there's nothing else that can actually satisfy that self. And when we are chanting, we are actually practicing the self-love because by chanting, we are calling out to Krishna who's, who's then... In his presence, he, uh, he gives us that love. And this is another very, very beautiful aspect of bhakti, that in all the other traditions, paths, 
you know, when you fall down, you have to start all over again mm. from ground zero. But bhakti, you know, there is the, in the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's a verse that says that even if you run with both your eyes closed, mm. you'll still not trip and fall. Mm. And so even if there is some imperfections within us or anything that we are not able to achieve still, so this is this beautiful poem by Rumi, come, come, whoever you are, wanderer, worshiper, lover of learning, it doesn't matter. Ours is not a caravan of despair. Come, even if you have broken your vows a thousand times, come yet again, come, come. Mm. You know? This is Krishna's. <laughs> this is really Krishna. And, you know, this is something that I think we've mentioned this so many times that we've seen it, This, mm. you know, that if a person simply just, there's only one thing that one needs to mm. kind of just keep making progress in bhakti, and that is to just show up. Mm. The mind will throw a thousand reasons, the, the you know, the heart, you know, the, just our conditioned self will take us in so many different directions. But as long as we just stay tightly packed with devotees, with devotees, then we'll find that um, we'll be, we'll, we'll be carried. Mm. And we had that experience one time in Vrindavan where we had gone uh, during the month of October and there's a very special festival, uh, Radha Kund uh, appearance day. And I remember it was the, mid so we had gone at midnight to take a dip in that, uh, in that pond, which actually belongs to Radha, Radharani. And my goodness. Like tens of thousands of people were packed together in a very small area. Uh, it's like an ocean of people. <laughs> it was literally, and I, and I said, there's no way I am actually going there right now because it felt intimidating. But somehow, you know, I just said, okay, maybe I'll go and see what's going on there. Mm -hmm. As soon as I got there, I was literally just picked up mm -hmm. and I was you know there was a chain i was placed up beyond that chain somebody held my hand we climbed over a wall you were you were also you, yeah. you went uh, later right yeah. i went to, we were, yeah yeah you, yeah right so, so somebody helped us climb the wall and and pushed us over the wall and took us to the pond and got us to take a dip in the pond and then again the reverse process yeah and we didn't even know like how we got back and mm -hmm. that's what it means to be tightly packed together is uh, of course right now we're practicing social distancing but still mm -hmm. You know, through this medium of our uh, online portal, we are back together. Mm. So this is actually how Bhakti can be. Um, so I think what we'll do is this section, we'll do it on Monday yeah, now. Yeah, Monday. So we'll skip this and um, we'll end with, this is it? This is the last video? Yeah. Okay. So uh, the last uh, verse of this uh, chapter. Krishna says that, Amanmanama uh, Bhad Bhakto Madhyaji Mahanamaskuru. Become my devotee, offer obeisances to me, worship me, and surely you will come to me. So we just found this interesting video of Boy George singing, bow down, mister. It's actually one of the most difficult things for us to do, right? Yeah, bow down. wanted to start, you know finish it off with this and this is actually what it means is to place our head on the lotus feet of krishna mm. and bow down we have bowed down before death before disease you bow down in front of this body every single day every like single I, day. i've been having this toothache for the last week or so and every time it happens you have to bow down there's nothing you can do yeah so you know this is a this is a way for us you know because sometimes when we hear the word surrender it feels like you know mm. but we're surrendering to so many things but surrender to Krishna is sweet, right? Mm -hmm. It means giving up our false conception and just 
finding that warm, loving embrace of Krishna. So we'll pause here, stop here, and we'll continue next Monday with more. There's more stuff coming in Bhakti Yoga. But we'll take your reflections, your questions, and comments. We really are lucky and enriched having the bouquet of different presentations prepared. After a lot of beautiful work and research carried out on knowledge, bhakti, devotion, karma, yoga, love, and lot more. Thank you. <laughs> we really appreciate your words of encouragement because sometimes we think we have taken on a project that is bigger than us. <laughs> <But we're laughs> bhakti is so beautiful. <laughs> yes, we are happy and grateful that also, you know, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. You guys are allowing it to happen, actually. It's because you guys show up, then that gives us that boost for the next day. Like, okay, we've got to do it because everyone will be here. <laughs> so, any any comments for the comments? Oh my goodness, to Srimad Bhagavatam. You need another body. Tapas Prabhu. Uh, <laughs> but actually, that'll be fun, but we won't do it every day. <laughs> you guys have to now take, take up the mantle. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, Srimad Bhagavatam has 18,000 verses. So. Yeah, yeah, that'll be fun. Mithidasha is looking very, very gravely at me. Yeah, you, you can go ahead and do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, you know, why I'm feeling sorry is that with the speed at which we are going, it's going, it going to end soon, and then what, what next? <laughs> <laughs> we'll find something. <laughs> yeah, I was just teasing her that the movie time is going to get over very soon. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 we'll find something, don't worry. <laughs> Are we meeting for chanting tomorrow, Mataji? Yes, 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 yes. There's a lot more. I mean, see, the thing is what we have covered is, uh, you know, this is the beauty of bhakti, you know, that um, I really think that we should maybe enter into the text you know, mm. and read the purports and, you know, like we could even do that. So now you guys are ready for a deeper and plunge. So. Even after we finish Bhagavad Gita now, and it'll, you can, even if you do it all over again, it looks like you, you're starting fresh because yes. every time you do start again, you find something new. Yes, definitely. And it's never ending. It's never ending. That is for sure. So, so when is this ending tomorrow? Tomorrow time is time, 7.30. Oh, 7.30, okay. Yeah, yeah. So anybody else with any other comments on our, um, you know, on bhakti and uh, anything that stood out for you or you want to add? Even the old people, you know, please feel free. Not enjoy. old people, but yeah. Not the old, old people, <laughs> but yeah. The, <laughs> the young yes, old people. The young old people. Yes, Daryl, go ahead. Yeah, I, I know um, my takeaway was that, um, you know, and um, Loka, you just you just mentioned it. How um, you know we go through so many things. We go through um, stresses. We go through worries. We go through you know heartache. We go through you know sickness. All these different things. You know, but we're really when we when we put when we lean on Krishna. You know, we put all of those worries and doubts and fears and all those different things on Krishna. You know, our life is is is. We, we go through less, you know, because Krishna is able to, to, to liberate us from those things, you know, and I just look at, I look at the world, I look at, you know, how many people are not, you know, engulfed in this and, you know, especially with everything that's going on now, so many people would, would benefit from practicing that. That's very nice. It's true. It's true. And that is our... Our work here is, is to share this. Bhakti means sharing, so sharing it as much as we can. Actually, that's the mood of all the pure devotees in Vrindavan, you know. Whenever someone kind of gets distracted, say, hey, what are you doing? You know, mm. come on, you know. And so that's really, really pleasing uh, to Krishna. So, yeah, it's the work that we have. Swarna, any thoughts from you? Kalpana. Yes. Yeah, actually, everybody was saying, uh, everybody around me was saying this year did not turn out to be great. But not for me because I found you guys like so I really take this as a very positive uh, feeling for me and you know what was happening around me it really doesn't affect me because you know all this satsang is like really keeping me afloat and thank you for that. And the feeling is mutual I guess the, the biggest gift we have received because of this pandemic is, is you all. Absolutely yeah. not no doubt we couldn't have made it you yeah. know uh, without you guys through this you know through this 
time period, you know. So we're so grateful for this Sangha, this, this kind of space that uh, you guys have allowed us to create. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, anybody else? Zuma, we haven't heard from you in a long time. Love to hear anything from you. Yeah, Prabhu, I also have a <laughs> lot of things to say, but I'm like bottling it up. So uh, Friday is mostly Mataji's uh, fun day, fable day. So I have a story uh, to say, but I don't know if there is time. Go ahead, go ahead. So it is pretty irrelevant, but again, it's going to find its relevance. So uh, there was a thief. Um, so this story happens in uh, down south and uh, we all are aware of uh, Shivji. So Shivji is like uh, the three uh, uh, God that we have, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, uh, Mahesh. So Shivji is uh, like uh, prayed with the photograph or with the linga. Mm. So there was a thief who was passing uh, uh, from a temple and he was like he wants to steal everything so he he says okay let me go get inside this temple and uh, steal something and then I'll uh, you know uh, sell them and I'll be in riches so he gets inside and then uh, then from the top uh, uh, um, Shivji is watching so Vishnu uh, uh, ji just goes running to him and he says that are you seeing what's going to happen this thief has got inside your temple and he's going to steal things. So he's like, it's okay. I mean, he's going to do it for uh, himself. He's going to feed himself, feed his family and maybe feed the community. So it's okay. Let him steal. Let's see what he steals. So uh, then um, he, he steals everything. And before leaving, he sees the Shivlinga and then he says like, there's a bell hanging on the top. So then uh, Vishnuji looks, out, looks at uh, Shivji and says, Are you, do you really know what's coming? So he's like, uh, no, let me see. So then this guy uh, goes near the linga and he uh, sees a stool. And uh, I mean, he doesn't find anything. So he wants to, he just jumps on top of the linga and takes the bell out and he, uh, you know, uh, climbs down. So then Vishnuji is like, now you have to do something. He stood on your head and he took the bell out. And then uh, Shivji is like, come on, you're rolling your eyes on me. He is so, he's so faithful. Just look at his bhakti. He had nothing to offer. So he offered himself to me because we have this tradition of uh, putting flowers and uh, leaves and on uh, Shiv Linga when we do uh, Shivratri and all those. So he said that, you know, he had nothing in his hand. So he offered himself and then he took the bell because the bell was hanging on top of it. So he took it. So... <clears throat> This is a story actually uh, my father used to keep telling me that whenever I used to ask him that, you know, um, bhakti, I have to take bath, I have to do this. So my father always had this thing uh, to say that, you know, you don't have to do anything. He, they are reaching their hands to you. It's just that you have to open your arms and just... Uh, take that uh, hand and, you know, go ahead in your life. It's nothing that you don't have to do karma kanda and, you know, to yeah. get the uh, God's uh, blessings. They're there. They're, they're just giving you anything and everything. Even if you're climbing on their head, they're okay with it. They're saying you're offering yourself to me. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> inspired by Mataji, so yeah. I had this story. So, I'm like, okay, let me tell. This is like bhakti for me uh, from... Like very young age, this was my, uh, something was explained to me by my father that this is bhakti. You don't have to do anything. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Juma. Thank, Thank you so you. much for sharing that beautiful story. beautiful story. Yes, Tapas Prabhu, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, I have a question, uh, Prabhuji and Mataji. So, you know, you, while discussing, you said that uh, the ultimate form of bhakti is when you do things for Krishna's happiness, mm -hmm. not for... Uh, uh, not for your good, but for Krishna's happiness. So like, you know, when we chant, when we chant or when you, you know, uh, uh, do something, how do we, how do we really see that, you know, happiness in him? Like my point is like, you know, suppose, like I, I'll, I'll give you some, some example. Like suppose when I cook something, I remember when I cooked that Mishti Dhai and Loka Prabhu would enjoy so much. You know, that is happiness. Okay, fine. I can see his happiness. Right? When you chant, how can you really see or experience that happiness in Krishna? 
or whenever you do something, how can you really see and experience that happiness in Krishna? I guess I'll take a stab at it. And Krishna's happiness is reflected in our own heart. So the happiness that we see in, in, in uh, Krishna's happiness is felt in many different ways. Uh, it is felt in, in uh, simplest ways. We, we also feel very happy and peaceful. Uh, that is a directly reflection of Krishna's happiness. Uh, our faith increases in bhakti. Our taste increases in bhakti. That is also a reflection that Krishna is happy with it, right? And uh, our desire to serve others, that increases. That is also uh, a reflection of Krishna's happiness. So whatever we experience in bhakti is actually um, uh, is a reflection of Krishna's happiness. And then especially devotees, when, when we see devotees being happy with us, then that is uh, like 100% guarantee of Krishna's being happy with us. Yeah, that is actually the most practical way for us to know whether Krishna is happy. Hmm. Because like you're saying, at this level in our Krishna consciousness, we don't know. But when you see, you know, because a devotee is a representative of Krishna, and so you will see that, you know, the devotees will be very pleased mm. and they will encourage you and they will be, you know, um, you will, you'll see their satisfaction in their eyes mm. and in their behavior. And then, you know, that this is satisfying to Krishna. That is the most practical, most tangible way. No, I mean, I, th I think I didn't put my question correctly. I, I, I didn't want to know that. How do I know that Krishna is happy? It is just what I wanted to know is that how can I, um, how can I expect, like, you know, when I'm chanting, let's say, and I want to chant, feeling that okay, Krishna is happy. So no, what do I do? I do I uh, imagine his smiling face or oh. or uh, um, his uh, you know naughty full uh, demeanor? Or I mean, you know what 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 do I really uh, you know aim for? You know that that's basically no, what I want to ask. What we aim for is a service attitude. You know, Prabhupada has very nicely he has. He has described to us, you know, in the simplest way that, you know, we are, we are simply requesting that Krishna, please accept, please accept mm -hmm. me and please let me know how I can engage in your service. Simple. It's very simple. And this is, uh, this is the mood of a devotee, actually. How may I serve you? And I've not come to you for anything else, but simply to render service. And in that selfless mood of service, then Krishna is automatically pleased. He's already pleased, just mm -hmm. like Juma said, you know that he, he doesn't really want anything from us. He's taking care of us even when we decide to step our foot on his head, right? Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, our entire life, we, that's all we have done, right? Mm -hmm. We keep stepping our foot and, and throw a tantrum and everything. It still loves us. That's how we, can, we get to breathe and we get to do whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. But now we get a chance to actually offer something more valuable than simply our tantrums, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> And that is our desire to, just like a mother, right? A mother takes care of a baby. What is she looking for? Okay. She just wants that the child starts to express some gratitude and say, you know. And like you can see how like a little, like a two-year-old two year old baby, uh, they will do things that they know that pleases their mother, right? They will sometimes, they know certain things that pleases the mother and they will just do an acting of doing that. They're not actually doing it, they're just doing an acting of doing that. So that thought in their head that, okay, this will please my mother and then let me just do that. That itself pleases Krishna. Actually, Shama Bhakti, uh, you know, shared this really nice um, uh, analogy, which maybe, you know, we can share. And I think it's very, very beautiful. I don't know if she's, if she's here. It's a very beautiful analogy about, you know, in India, um, in traditionally, and for those who may not be familiar, sometimes kids would get married at a very, very early age. Mm. So the father would sort of like marry the daughter, like at the age of seven, eight, whatever. And then she would not stay with the husband. So it's just that the arrangement has been made and she's married, but she's still staying in her father's house. And every once in a while, you know, the boy would visit. So they actually grow up together, knowing that they're going to be with each other, you know? And so they get, they, so they, you know, the boy would visit the, the, the girl's house and then the mother would say, you know, go cook for him, you know, spend time. And she's like, I don't want to go. I just want to go and play, <laughs> right? Because she has no, she, has, she doesn't have any feelings for him. Like, she's just like, whatever, why, why does he come here every once in a while? And, so they're still getting to know each other and, and, you know, but she just does it because, you know, the mother teaches them the external, you know, ways in which you relate. And then of course, when puberty comes and, and then there is, you know, some feelings arise in the heart naturally. And now you've spent time with each other. Now that feeling of love and the feeling of wanting to serve and, you know, express that love, you know, starts to manifest in different ways. Mm -hmm. 
So it's a crude example and maybe a little, you know, difficult to understand culturally, even for us, you know, mm -hmm. this was back in the day, you know, but the point being that with, in our relationship with Krishna, it's a bit like that right now. But we're simply following the, the, the external, you know, processes of chanting and reading, but we don't really have that natural, you know, love that, that comes about when we are mature. So, At least like when we start our chanting, we can pray to Krishna that, Krishna, please uh, may my chanting uh, bring pleasure to you. And uh, I'm doing this for your pleasure, but I'm very imperfect. So please allow me to hear your name properly and uh, focus on you. So if you pray like that, then Krishna will listen to that. So thank you, Amrita, for your comment. Uh, we begin to see. I really like the story. Yes, the story. Okay, so. All right. All right. Delia, any thoughts from you? You become quieter. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm not feeling too well. Oh, I'm um, sorry to hear that. Okay. Yeah, just some back pain, but um, I I was wondering if I could share my fate. One of my favorite poems by Rumi. Yeah, you had Rumi and Hafiz both in your presentation, and I was just thinking. Um, I, I discovered primarily Rumi when I was um, a student in high school, and he became my favorite poet. Yeah. And I think that. Like, I think Rumi just embodies perfect bhakti. Mm -hmm. And I think, like, I recognized even then, like, this, there, there's this ecstatic, mystical, all-in kind of love um, that I just, I just recognize as being different from, like, anything else. And so I just really liked it. Um, so I'll put the, the poem in the chat box. Oh, no, that's not it. That's... <laughs> <laughs> no, I was also sorry. I was also reading that earlier. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we were, I was, we were talking local action now that we should be. We'll probably talk about Shastra, mm -hmm. Shastra on Monday. So beautiful. All right. Um. I know, like sometimes it's hard to just listen to things. It's nice to like be able to to read along. So. Okay. Um, Lord, said David, since you do not need us, why did you create these two worlds? Reality replied, O oh, prisoner of time, I was a secret treasure of kindness and generosity, and I wished this treasure to be known. So I created a mirror, its shining face, the heart, its darkened back, the world. The back would please you if you've never seen the face. Mm. Has anyone ever produced a mirror out of mud and straw? yet clean away the mud and straw and the mirror might be revealed. Until the juice ferments a while in the cask, it isn't wine. If you wish your heart to be bright, you must do a little work. Mm -hmm. My king addressed the soul of my flesh. You returned just as you left. Where are the traces of my gifts? We know that alchemy transforms copper into gold. The sun doesn't want a crown or a robe from God's grace. He is a hat to a hundred bald men, a covering for 10 who were naked. Jesus sat humbly on the back of an ass, my child. How could a Zephyr ride an ass? Spirit, find your way in seeking low, lowness like a stream. Reason, tread the path of selflessness into eternity. Mm. Remember God so much that you were forgotten. Let the caller and the called disappear, be lost in the call. Beautiful. So beautiful. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, so nice. Yeah. Very nice. So beautifully. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's... I think that's the very applicable to our chanting. Let the caller and call disappear. Right. Be lost in the call. Yeah. yeah lost in the call. So, so, so many bhakti concepts in there. Yeah. So many bhakti concepts. That's what I was looking at. You know, you get so lost in that, you know, that mirror, right? <laughs> I, think that was I have one more input like uh, for me uh, like I visited Vrindavan at my very tender age and I feel uh, bhakti in India is Vrindavan like mm -hmm. you don't even feel like Krishna is Krishna because he is like a next door mm -hmm. boy who is staying there and everybody is like it's so casual it's no normal as if he's staying there so for me uh, Vrindavan is bhakti mm -hmm. oh that is such a beautiful thing you said and you know what we could do we should make a plan at some yeah, point, we'll absolutely. Come together, and then we, you know, there are places in Vrindavan which are, as you just described, 
you, you stand there in the evening, like especially this place called, called Ter Kadamba. Actually, that's one of the things we should do after the session is over. Mm. All the Bhagavad Gita chapters will take you guys on a virtual tour. Mm. And there's this one place, Ter Kadamba, in the evening, the cows actually come back mm. and it creates this dust. And you almost can, like, you, you almost feel like he's just going to appear know. out of that dust. <laughs> yeah. Even those Tulsi plants, which are like bowed down, that uh, yeah. garden, which is all bowed down, where they still believe that there is. Uh, there is like uh, Krishna dances in the night and everything happens, like all the gopis are around. Everything is mystic, everything from every dust. Vrindavan is infused, like it's so thick, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So we'll stop here. Thank you guys. You are an amazing, amazing group of people. And we'll see you guys on Monday. I guess we'll see you tomorrow for chanting. Hare Krishna. But I, I also, that is one of my favorite stories also. And incidentally, it's also one of the favorite stories of your uh, sister-in-law. You know, she was, that was one of the first, I don't know, Radhika Nam is there. Radhika Nam, you want to share something? This story, I know you, you really used to love it when you first came. Oh, Hare Krishna. <laughs> yeah, that out of many stories, that was my favorite story. It made me uh, yeah, I think, uh, yeah, it made me feel that, oh, that kind of love, which um, um, which we can't actually vocalize it, the story spoke it, right? That we want that kind of love, where there is, the other person is not thinking about their own self, mm -hmm. but rather always of giving it, that never even strikes them. Mm -hmm. There's so much in love that all they think about is the other person. So, and we are all seeking that kind of love, the love which we are, um, yeah, so I think everybody understood that story. It's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. It speaks to all of us. And I think coming from your mouth, it became really more beautiful that time when I heard it for the first time because it was like bhakti text and devotees and the story, they all made too much of sense to me. So, yeah. Thank you. And Shama Bhakti, uh, you, know, you can see her. She's on, on the next screen to Radhika. She's the one who shared with me the story of this uh, boy and the parents getting the girl married. And I don't think I did a good job of representing your story, Shao Bhakti. But <laughs> it's no, Mataji, story. you did a very you did a fantastic <laughs> job. I think it's from, uh, I mean, it's uh, it has an Indian background having, a, you know, child marriages. So those who had seen or heard about it would be able to understand it better. <laughs> yeah. Also wanted to say that when I heard that, uh, when you were saying that story again today, I would know that Shweta would love it. Oh, really? was... <laughs> oh nice. Oh, nice. All right. So, see you guys. Thank you, Rajesh Ji, for joining. It's good to have you. Amrita, always a pleasure. All of you guys, Amritvani, Pramod Ji, Achyuta Rade, Swarnab. What a, what a great, uh, you know, we are honored that you, you, you chose, you know, <laughs> chose to come today, Swarnab. And we didn't get a chance to hear from you, but he's amazing. He's been reading Bhagavatam and yeah, yeah. Twice. Twice or twice, whatever. No, no. Come. Well, the only reason that I'm really interested is because, well, um, it's very, it's just, it's just the, what, it's just like the best thing to basically do. Mm. Mm. It's one of the, because it's so spiritual, you always learn something new and it's just a great experience, which mm. is why I do it so many times. Thank you, Swano. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wish in my next life I can also start as early as you have started. <laughs> Quick work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Everyone, a lot of people are work in progresses. Yes, that is true. That is true. Probably, um, me too. Well, <laughs> yes. now we're all. Yes, we are. probably, we yeah, all. You know, you should have a plaque, you know, work in progress, inconvenience, regretted. <laughs> Excuse the noise. <laughs> be careful. What is it? Uh, be more caution, something. What is it? Um, anyways, there's always that little thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you so much.